This is a special edition of Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Tragedy in Chattanooga. I can tell you that um, there are no braver or more selfless people in the Chattanooga Police Department. And I can tell you that the officers of the Chattanooga Police Department saved many lives today. And I've never been prouder to be a public servant. Witnesses describe it as a hailstorm of bullets that tore through the two military centers. A supposed case of domestic terrorism allegedly carried out by someone who grew up here, a homegrown 24-year-old man. There's been a, a very major crash that happened earlier this evening. Still a very active scene. Six people have died. At least 15 are injured. This is going to take several hours. Volkswagen Chattanooga finds itself in the middle of an international business scandal. That includes the 2014-15 diesel Passat made here in Chattanooga. We have a very serious situation involving a report of a Chattanooga police officer who has been shot. There are still emergency vehicles racing behind me. Right now we are not sure how many shooters, if they are still being sought for, if they have anyone in custody. We are not sure, but what we do know was that there was a police involved shooting near the Naval Reserve Center on the Indicola Highway. Yeah, just pulled up to Erlanger Hospital. Uh, I want to go ahead and show you the scene outside the emergency room. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven or eight police cars were out here, unmarked sheriff's deputies and Chattanooga police. There was a situation, another shooting earlier this morning in the 6200 block of Lee Highway. So police are telling Kelly that uh, apparently that's where this started and then spread over to the Amnicola Highway area. You see pictures there at the River Park. They, they are searching for an active shooter. We've heard 30 to 40 uh, police cars uh, up and down Amnicola, and this is serious business, folks. Well, at first we heard, of course, several gunshots, and then uh, all of the, the policemen started arriving. Eyewitnesses told me that uh, around 1045 this morning, this man came into the parking lot. He loaded up his gun, and then he just started firing off shots. We are hearing from Kelly McCarthy that it is no longer an active shooter situation. One can draw a number of conclusions from that. The good news we can report from Erlanger, that police officer said to be in stable condition, family by his side, but Blood Assurance really needs your donations today. We have pictures now, uh, as we have reported to you earlier, of the bullet holes. This is from the Lee Highway location there. I want to show you some new photos that have just come in. We've been continuing to monitor all of our social media accounts as the situation develops. These are photos taken from inside of one of those those recruiting centers, you see there multiple, multiple shots fired into the front there. You can see in the upper right hand corner that says the U.S. Marine Recruiting Center. Was there any prior indication that there might be, a, might be an attack today? No, we had no, no intelligence indicating there would be any type of attack today. There were numerous Chattanooga and Hamilton County officers who responded. Uh, they, they arrived on the scene extremely quickly and they actively and enthusiastically engaged uh, this brazen criminal. Thought, wow, this is this is really going on in Chattanooga. This is where we live. That's uh that's hard, man. The suspect, according to what we've been able to gather, is apparently from our area or at least a resident of our area. We are not clear exactly how that shooter died. We found out that the active shooter situation had ended and uh, one could assume that the shooter was shot by a police officer, but he very well may have also turned the gun on himself, and that answer was not given at the press conference this afternoon. Mayor Andy Burke very rightfully opened the press conference today by calling today a nightmare for Chattanooga. The suspect in the Chattanooga shooting has been identified as Muhammad Youssef Abdulaziz. To recap a little bit about what we've learned from police, we do know that this is the scene where four Marines were shot and killed by a single shooter. That shooter is also now dead. But at one point we did get to hear that the officer, Officer Pedigo, was in stable condition. A gunshot went to the ankle. I'm deeply saddened, I'm concerned, and this is a horrific act. This cannot be tolerated. This is a special edition of Channel 3 Eyewitness News, Tragedy in Chattanooga. I can tell you that um, there are no braver or more selfless people in the Chattanooga Police Department. And I can tell you that the officers of the Chattanooga Police Department saved many lives today, and I've never been prouder to be a public servant. 
Tonight we report on the unthinkable. Our country appears to have once again been struck by an act of terrorism, this time right here on Chattanooga soil. Four Marines are dead. The motive for the attacks remains unknown. Good evening, thank you for joining us. I'm Greg Glover. And I'm Cindy Sexton. We are waiting on a live press conference from the Department of Justice happening right here in Chattanooga. They're not ready to start that just yet. So in the meantime, still many, many questions around the tragedy that unfolded today. A recap of the facts. Four Marines are dead, several injured, including a Chattanooga police officer who's said to be recovering well after surgery and a Navy sailor who is still listed in critical condition tonight. The shooter is dead, and during a raid led by the FBI at his home, two women were taken in for questioning. This was a quick response by multiple law enforcement agencies. Let's take a look back at how it all unfolded. 10.45 a.m. Shots were fired at the Armed Forces Career Center on Lee Highway. These photos show the extent of the damage. Bullet holes nearly framing a decal declaring a property a gun-free zone. Police then pursued the gunman seven miles away to the Navy Operational Support Center and Marine Corps Reserve Center complex off Amnicola Highway. Calls for assistance rang out across the region. Streets were blocked. Hospitals locked down. Airspace closed. People at Chat State and other area businesses were instructed to shelter in place. An errant bullet from the shootout hit the Coca-Cola bottling plant across the street. From the first shots fired to the last was no more than half an hour. By 1.30, authorities tweeted, active shooter situation is over. When the smoke cleared, among the shattered glass and crime scene tape, a Chattanooga police officer and a Navy sailor were injured, but four U.S. Marines had paid the ultimate price. The shooter was also dead, identified as 24-year-old Muhammad Yusuf Abdulaziz. He was a graduate of Red Bank and UTC, believed to have been born in Kuwait. This mugshot comes from a recent DUI arrest. At 3 p.m., a press conference, Mayor Andy Burke calls the attacks uncomprehensible. U.S. Attorney Bill Killiam terms the incident an act of domestic terrorism. In the 4 o'clock hour, officers converge on the gunman's house. Two women were taken away in handcuffs. Just after 5 o'clock... Uh, ...about the tragic shooting that took place in Chattanooga. From the Oval Office, the president referred to the day's events in Chattanooga as, quote, a heartbreaking circumstance. He called the nation to pray for the families and promised a prompt investigation. Before sundown, the governor was in town meeting with city leaders as worship centers opened their doors to those looking for answers, solace or strength. Tell you a little bit about what we just watched. Governor Haslam, I think, encapsulated the day pretty well, starting off saying, it's a great city with a broken heart tonight. Senator Corker mentioned four heroes uh, fallen, of course, talking about those four Marines and mentioned that uh, one person still in very serious condition tonight. We think that's that uh, Navy sailor who was also injured in the shooting today. And Mayor Burke said we cannot countenance what happened to the four families today, talking to the Marine, talking to about the families of the Marines who were killed. Law enforcement spent the better part of the afternoon inside the family home of Abdul Aziz. All is pretty quiet right now. You can see crime tape is still up behind me with a law enforcement presence uh, guarding the home and guarding the street tonight. But this is really just the beginning as federal investigators try to get to the heart of his exact motive. Well, I'm here live at the recruiting center here off of Lee Highway. I'm going to step out of the way and let you take a look. This is where folks have placed American flags, balloons, wreaths. There's some signs over there as well. Good afternoon. From the scene of the opening shots of yesterday's shooting spree in Chattanooga, Lee Highway at 153, I'm David Carroll. And I'm Cindy Sexton. It has been an emotional and heartbreaking 24 hours for the city of Chattanooga. We do have more about the victims who were killed during yesterday's rampage. The, they've been identified as 40-year-old Thomas Sullivan from Springfield, Massachusetts. He had survived two tours of duty in Iraq. He had earned a Purple Heart. Also, a young man 21 years old, Skip Wells of Marietta, Georgia, recently graduated from Georgia Southern University. He was killed in that attack. He had just finished boot camp. The third victim has been named as David Wyatt, only 37 years old, a Hickson resident, originally from Arkansas, a husband and a loving father. And 27-year-old Sergeant Carson Holmquist, a Florida native. 
He's been identified as the fourth Marine. And so, again, our thoughts and prayers go to all those families. This is a special edition of Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Hope after tragedy. The memorial on Lee Highway continues to grow and so does the number of people stopping by to pay their respects for the fallen Marines and Navy sailor. We woke up Saturday morning and we already had known about the four fallen Marines. We were all pulling for the young man, the, the sailor who was fighting for his life. We talked about him here Friday evening. Randall Smith, 26 years old, a North Georgia resident, husband, father of three little girls. And like many of you, we learned Saturday morning that he also passed away. He was the fifth victim of the shootings. Staff Sergeant David Wyatt of the U.S. Marine Corps was brought to the Chattanooga National Cemetery along a route lined with American flags. In the crowd, all ages, creeds, and colors, They came to honor, pay tribute, say thanks. To Navy Petty Officer Second Class Randall Smith. He will always be with you in the deepest recesses of your heart. And the day will come when his memory brings a smile to your lips before a tear to your eyes. It takes time. Nearly a month to the day, our city will never forget Vice President Joe Biden, Secretary of Defense Ash Carter, other military dignitaries, families of the servicemen and the community paused to honor the lives of the five military men killed in the July 16th attacks. Screeching tires, gunfire, those were the sounds of July 16th, 2015, sounds that transformed a beautiful summer morning into a day filled with tragedy and tears. We remember five servicemen who gave their lives on Chattanooga soil in an attack that shook the city and the nation. And in this much anticipated all day concert event, the lives of Lance Corporal Squire Skip Wells, Staff Sergeant David Wyatt, Gunnery Sergeant Thomas Sullivan, Sergeant Carson Holmquist, and Navy Petty Officer Second Class Randall Smith are being honored in Chattanooga Unite the tribute on the river. It had been two months since the tragedy on July 16th, but it's very clear, very evident today that that day and those five fallen servicemen are nowhere near forgotten. People of all ages line Broad Street downtown this afternoon for today's Chattanooga Unite Parade. It took five months, but the FBI is ready to officially call this summer's attack in Chattanooga terrorism. The word is more than about setting the record straight. It means something much bigger for the survivors. Now with the terrorist label official, the Navy is giving out the Purple Heart for courage and sacrifice. Hours after a deadly wreck made an absolute mess of I-75, lights are still flashing on the interstate. We're live near the scene as investigators work to determine what caused this deadly crash. With coverage you can count on, this is Channel 3 Eyewitness News at 11. Channel 3 Eyewitness News reporter Michelle Heron is live near the scene where Chief of Police Fred Fletcher is about to give a news conference for us. Let's check in right now. And we have investigators from our very, very professional traffic investigation unit out here processing the crime scene, processing the evidence to make sure that everything that we need to fully document this incident is obtained. It, it extends over hundreds of feet and involves, as I said, as many as nine vehicles. So it's a very complicated scene. Here's a look at the scene from last night happening about 7.30 p.m. I-75 crews at this hour still working to clear that scene. It is 4.33 this morning. Eyewitness News reporter Dan Kennedy joins us with more. A lot of police are saying this is the worst accident they have ever seen in our area. Dan, good morning to you. No doubt it's difficult to reconstruct an accident like this, Jed. Not only is it on the interstate and cars traveling at high speeds, also involving tractor trailers. Uh, here we are eight hours almost uh, after this accident and police are still on the scene. I just watched them tow away. Actually, the best way to describe it is dislodged an SUV that was beneath the tractor trailer. That tractor trailer you see in the background and that car now sitting atop 
um, a record is just a mangled ball of metal. It's 12 hours later and the interstate remains closed and traffic is backing up. This is exit 11 at Udawa and uh, folks are still having to get off that exit. They were hoping to have this open up by rush hour, but the investigation is still ongoing. Well, just a few minutes ago, P Chattanooga police released the names of all of the 18 victims involved in that crash. Some of them are local. Some of them are from out of town. I do know that their ages range from as young as eight years old all the way to 55. And we will have that list of those names posted on our website, wrcbtv.com. Channel 3 obtained this surveillance video from a nearby business. Now the video that we have does include the moment of impact, but we're not going to show that out of respect to the victims and their families. What we are gonna focus on is exactly how long it took that 18 wheeler to stop after the impact. You'll see it's in the inside lane there on the other side of that pickup. And even after crashing into the eight cars that were stopped in front of it for construction, it took that big truck a long time to come to a full stop. Police were on the scene within minutes but before they got there, we spoke with one eyewitness who rushed to help after watching a car burst into flames. I still can't get over the smell. Uh, it, it was just, the smell was just so bad. For Michael Carraway of Udawa, there's things about Thursday night's crash he'll never forget. I wanted to be able to try to help somebody, but the fire was so hot and, and it just, there was nothing that nobody could do. Caraway saw the crash and rushed to try and help, but there was little he could do. He and eyewitnesses like Arthur Tucker watched helplessly. <laughs> One second, you're gone. One second. That's how fast it was, really fast. Tucker says he saw cars spinning, one flip, and another catch fire. It was the worst thing I've ever seen. I've never seen a wreck or any, I've never seen anything like that. It took 12 hours for police to reopen this stretch of interstate. A drone at one point circled overhead to get aerials of that crash, and investigators are still working to find out what all happened. Reporting from Udawa, Dan Kennedy, Channel 3 Eyewitness News. For new details tonight in last month's fatal crash on I-75 in Udawa, the National Transportation Board says Benjamin Brewer, the truck driver who caused the crash, had been on duty for 50 consecutive hours when that crash happened. Brewer was driving north on I-75 when he slammed into several cars, stopped in a construction zone. Six people were killed, including two children, and many others were injured. Brewer was indicted this afternoon by a Hamilton County grand jury on more than a dozen charges. Some of them include vehicular homicide, driving under the influence, and speeding. Volkswagen Chattanooga finds itself in the middle of an international business scandal. And the scandal is growing by the day. After first admitting half a million cars were rigged to help meet emission standards, the company now says the number is 11 million. Now the EPA says the car maker could be hit with fines up to $37,500 per vehicle for those violations. That's a total of more than $18 billion. And it will also have to make those repairs at its own expense. And you may be asking uh, what happens from here. The owner of Village Volkswagen here in Chattanooga says Volkswagen owners should be hearing from Volkswagen corporate very soon about what repairs are necessary. And the dealership is fully prepared to help those customers. Live at the VW plant, I'm Matt Barber, Channel 3 Eyewitness News. At this time, Volkswagen has halted the sale of the 2015 models, and they are prohibited from selling any 2016 models until the problem has been fixed. Today, we're learning that the government could fine Volkswagen some $18 billion. Reporting live at Enterprise South, Natalie Potts, Channel 3 Eyewitness News. David, obviously it's no secret that thousands of people depend on this Volkswagen plant in here in Chattanooga to make their living. New details are emerging from the cheating case hovering over Volkswagen. A class action lawsuit was filed in Chattanooga by attorneys representing several local VW drivers. But a lot of people believe that this meeting really showed that the state is backing this plant and the employees that work there. The governor told reporters that he doesn't believe that, you know, the, the folks that work inside this plant Plant. This doesn't reflect them in their work ethic. This was something that uh, this was a problem that was globally over or that happened over in Germany. It's been nearly a month since the worldwide Volkswagen emissions cheating scandal made headlines. Some of those cars were made in Chattanooga and are driven by local city leaders. The recall affected 11 million Volkswagen vehicles, nearly 500,000 cars here in the U.S. Channel 3 Eyewitness News reporter Kelly McCarthy explains how even Chattanooga's mayor and city police officers are dealing with this just like all the others. 
Among the 11 million Volkswagen cars built with software to cheat emissions testing, more than a dozen of those cars are owned by the city of Chattanooga. We really are in the same boat as everybody else. We have 14 vehicles and like multi Volkswagen owners, we're waiting for a fix. About 1,300 cars make up the Chattanooga City fleet, used by city employees for official business. I think we found out like everybody else through a press release. David Carmody says 14 of the city's cars are affected by the Volkswagen emissions investigation. Some of those cars are driven by police officers, city engineers, and at times even Mayor Andy Burke. Two vehicles that are assigned to the mayor's office and actually it's available to a lot of different people. So you're talking it probably it's available to 12 people. So it's not just the mayor. So people working in the mayor's office usually drive a 2012 Volkswagen Jetta and a Passat. But once they learned of the upcoming recall, those cars were taken off the road and replaced by older fleet cars. The rest of the city owned Volkswagens are still in service. Well, they're all in service. We're like most Volkswagen owners, we're waiting for a recall information and to see what the next steps are. Even though Volkswagen has not yet come up with a solution for the car's emissions testing or a timeline for when that fix will take place, the company has said multiple times that the solution will come at no cost to the car's owner. We'll let you know as soon as Volkswagen releases more information. In Chattanooga, Kelly McCarthy, Channel 3 Eyewitness News. New developments in the fallout from Volkswagen's cheating scandal. Automotive News has reported that VW halted production of diesel powered 2016 Passat midsize sedans at its Chattanooga plant. No word yet as to what impact this could have on our local workers. Chattanooga has advanced to the final round for Outside Magazine's Best Town Ever contest. Can you believe just 45 years ago this was dubbed the dirtiest city in America by Walter Cronkite? Now it's a national finalist for best town ever. Why is Chattanooga the best town ever? Well, we don't even need to ask that question because we experience it every day, each, each and every one of us. Best town ever? That's easy. Look around downtown Chattanooga on any given day and check out what you see. Open water swim, you can kayak, you can canoe, you can stand up paddleboard. You can rock climb, you can rappel, you can go caving, you can go hang gliding. It's not hard to rattle off a list of outdoors activities in Chattanooga. Chattanooga is pretty much the trailhead to all of outdoors. Maybe that's why it's beat out cities like Beaufort, South Carolina and Raleigh, Durham and Boone, North Carolina to make it to the finals in Outside Magazine's annual competition for best town ever. It's beautiful. There's always super fun stuff to do. I've lived here, yeah, for my whole life and pretty much just watched it change dramatically. And maybe that change is something Walter Cronkite never did foresee when he named the scenic city the dirtiest city in America in 1969. Look at us now. So quick, let's make this happen. Voting ends at 11.59 tonight. We have a link to vote on our website, wrcbtv.com, and a winner will be announced tomorrow. Reporting from Chattanooga, Dan Kennedy, Channel 3 Eyewitness News. All the precincts have reported and the votes are in on this Friday. Chattanooga has been named the best town of 2015. Well, in less than two hours, the U.S. women's national soccer team will kick off their big game against Costa Rica. I see Paul Shaheen in the upper right hand of your screen standing by live inside with a look at the action. But first, here is Channel 3 Eyewitness News reporter Matt Barber with more on the fan turnout from the gates of Finley. What's going on, Matt? Hey there, David. Yeah, that's right. The gates just opened at 5 o'clock, and if you can see here behind me, this is what 20,000 fans look like. They're all real excited. You hear the music pumping. We even have some young fans right here. USA! 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 It might not rain for the entire game or the entire evening, but we can't rule out that we could see at least a couple of showers pass over. Uh, at times during the course of the game. Cindy, the gates opened at 5 o'clock, but there are still crowds of people out here. They don't want to leave this block party. They call this the Fan Q headquarters. Just over an hour until kickoff here at Finley Stadium. Your World Cup champion, U.S. women's national soccer team will be here 
warming up the next time you see me. They'll be on the field probably within half an hour. Again, kickoff set for just after 6.30. But tonight it's a little different. It's not every day you have the reigning World Cup champions come to town. And for neighboring businesses here near and around Finley Stadium, riding the coattails of the U.S. national women's soccer team has been profitable to say the least. One woman I spoke with traveled seven hours from Florida just to see the U.S. women's national team in action. Ladies and gentlemen, U.S. Soccer welcomes you to Finley Stadium. Fans from near and far Whoa. sold out Finley Stadium to see the best team in women's soccer. Women's World Cup champions, the United States of America. Amanda Whitson made the trip driving seven hours from Florida. For her, the opportunity came on a whim. A last minute dropout gave me the opportunity to come with her. So I've known about this for about two weeks. Asked off two weeks ago, like, yes, perfect timing. Seeing the U.S. women's national team is an experience many, like Ashley Draper, couldn't miss. She made the trip from Johnson City for her first professional soccer game. After kind of like seeing them like winning the Olympics, you know, being so close in the last uh, FIFA tournament for them to actually like come back and like win, I just feel like it's kind of like at the hype right now. Players with the Sugar Hill Football Club out of Georgia got the opportunity of a lifetime after being chosen to serve as escorts for Team USA. They were up close and personal with the players. They held their hands, walked out on the field, the national anthem. It was just a once in a lifetime experience for these kids. Seven year old Eliza was one of those escorts. She likes to play midfield. You get to have fun and you get to kick around the ball and it's really fun. Eliza's mom also plays on an adult league. She says having the opportunity to see these women play is an example for young players like her daughter. If you lose one, go back out there, you know, give it your all. Don't don't ever give up. And that's that's one thing, you know, try hard, play hard, never give up. The hometown kids competing in NBC's The Voice came out swinging in the battle rounds last night. First up, Team Adam. We both have demons that we can stay. I love your demons. We are down to the top 10 as live rounds continue tonight on The Voice. Lee University student Jordan Smith is among those top 10. We are continuing our coverage for tonight's final performances for Lee University's Jordan Smith and Knoxville native Emily Ann Roberts. The four final contestants will compete tonight for a chance to win the whole competition. And tomorrow, America's votes will be revealed. Several artists will take the stage to perform these two days. Our own Dan Kennedy is live in Los Angeles and joins us live right now. And Dan, we're so excited. We see who you have with you right now. <laughs> Tell him hello from all of us. Hey, I know I just talked to y'all a while ago, but we just ran into Jordan Smith <laughs> on the red carpet, so we had to come back to him. And everybody says hello in Chattanooga, Jordan. We're all so happy you're able to talk to us right now. Oh, thank you so much. Hi, everybody. <laughs> you have a huge following worldwide, but it really started not only in your hometown in Kentucky, but everyone in Cleveland who knew you from the choir said, we knew he's going to do it all along. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's so special to me, um, just to be surrounded by those people that constantly saw things like this in me before I even saw them in myself. It's really special to me, and there's support it means absolutely the world to me. All right, I was just saying, I'm amazed at how you're able to do all these interviews. Now, in just a couple <laughs> of hours, you're going live on television performing three brand new songs. So what are you feeling right now? Um, yeah, I'm feeling excited. All three of these songs are, are, are special performances for me for different reasons. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to tonight. We've worked really, really hard all week to uh, prepare these performances for everyone. And I think that each of the contestants have some really special moments planned for tonight. You've also got a duet with Adam. Will you just tell me the kind of preparation that went into that. What's going to make this night different from others because of that? Yeah, Adam and I are singing God Only Knows by the Beach Boys, which is actually a unique challenge for me. We're singing the entire song in unison. And, um, you know, as a singer, that's, that's sometimes it's difficult. And so I'm having to focus on blending with him. And we spent time practicing together and recording this song in the studio together and really, uh, really nailing down those parts uh, really closely together. So it's it's been a lot of work, but it's, it's going to be a really fun performance. And it's going to be kind of a celebration yeah. of our time working together on the show. Certainly. And not tonight, but we do want to hear you sing the Chattanooga Choo Choo at some point. Can we have you do that at some point? <laughs> I'm sure I'll sing it for you All sometime. Right. And we'd love to see you at Riverbend someday. Thank you so much for joining Thanks us today. So Jordan, appreciate it. Good luck to you.
The ninth season of NBC's The Voice concluded tonight with a new winner, Lee University student Jordan Smith. He'd been the favorite all season. Tonight, he walked out with the top prize. So much excitement in our neck of the woods. We have team coverage of tonight's finale as those cheering Jordan on gathered in Cleveland. We find Eyewitness News reporter Kate Smith, who was at a voice watch party. We'll check back in with her in just a minute. But first, let's head to Los Angeles, where Eyewitness News anchor Dan Kennedy has reaction to tonight's win. It was just seconds ago. Dan, fill us in. Oh, yeah. It just happened and the excitement is real here in Los Angeles. It's actually one two punch from East Tennessee. You have Jordan Smith uh, getting first place, but then you have Emily Ann Roberts from Knoxville coming in second. So a lot of people in Tennessee and the volunteer state smiling big uh, this evening, but no one smiling bigger than Jordan Smith and his former classmates at Lee University, his choir director, those who've said all along that he's the guy and people have been saying that all season long. So what's next for Jordan Smith? That's a big question. You saw maybe he uh, won a car, a Nissan, as did the uh, other three this evening. So he walks away with a car, but he also walks away with a big record deal with a Universal Music Group as well. And then tomorrow he's catching a flight to New York City where he'll appear on the Today Show Thursday morning. So there is plenty ahead for Jordan Smith the next few days. He is on his way here to the red carpet. We expect him to be here in the next 12, 13 minutes or so. Of course, we're going to be talking with him. If you have any questions you would like for us to ask Jordan Smith this evening, we're going to be talking with him one on one within the next 30, 45 minutes. Just go ahead and tweet it to me at Dan O'Kennedy or put it on the WRCB Facebook page. We'll make sure we ask Jordan your question. It's a very exciting night from Los Angeles where we're reporting live. Dan Kennedy, Channel 3 Eyewitness News. It's the first day of work for volunteers as they roll up their sleeves to build a brand new home for a local soldier. Every aspect of this project is donated from the materials needed to build the home to the labor that will construct it. The home will accommodate all of the needs for Jason Smith and his family. Smith lost both of his legs in an IED blast while serving in Afghanistan. Each person here has their own reason for why they wanted to take part in building this soldier the home he deserves. It's just a great way to give back to a guy who's who's given his all for us. I mean, we're, we're, we're all Americans and we're all on the same team and these guys come back and they need our help and they have they have been out there fighting on the front lines protecting our freedom. So we're here to give back to them. Crews will be working around the clock to get this home completely built within the next week. And if you would like to help, it's not too late. You can not only donate your time, but also some of the materials that are needed. We have all of that posted on our website, WRCBTV.com. In Ringgold, I'm Michelle Heron, Channel 3 Eyewitness News. We care about people, and it's about changing somebody's life. After waiting nine days and turning this pile of dirt into a dream come true, the Smiths were finally given the keys to their new home. I don't think anybody would believe that. It looks like it's been here for a while. Their new home will host years of memories just waiting to happen. Uh, one memory that we've already made here is I was able to carry her through the, the, the doorway. It was unbelievable, man. It, it, you, you can't, words can't describe. It's gorgeous. Yeah, it's beautiful. A labor of nothing but love from everyone involved. You can feel the love, you know, from the walls. Like, I can't get this grin off my face. <laughs> that people love us to come together to do this for us. We didn't ask for this. But they couldn't be more thankful to the community that made it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, God bless. Yeah. In Catoosa County, I'm Megan Brantley, Channel 3 Eyewitness News. A tragic twist of fate brought these two women together. I know he specifically placed Kana in my life because how can I make this without her? You know, how can, how can you go on? How can you be happy and smile? Jerry's son Rocky was just about to turn 21. He was a new dad and had his whole life in front of him. But last summer, tragedy struck. He died following a fatal accident as he was leaving work at Lake Winnie. He just left work, turned left out of the parking lot, and went around the curve, and as he did, his right front wheel went off into the culvert, and the car flipped, and he flew out a window and hit a church sign. 
Jerry says she wasn't given any hope for a positive outcome. Doctors told her he had a 1% chance of surviving. And it was at that time she made the decision to honor his wishes to be an organ donor, saving other lives and sharing his journey. Kaina was one of those who's alive today because of Rocky. She was diagnosed five years ago with kidney disease and was on the waiting list. She had just about given up hope. When I got the call, I started crying. I knew it was of God. Happy and thankful, but sad at the same time. It was very mixed emotions because he was actually younger than my two children. And I felt so sorry for the family, just very sorry. Jerry says through Rocky's organ donations, at least three lives have been saved. January 1st, 2015, not even 30 minutes into the new year. People are still out celebrating New Year's Eve. We've got a couple in this house with a two-year-old and a six-month-old. That house sits along Dora Street. Outside were some men who it would soon be learned had very bad intentions. We stopped by the residence. It's now boarded up and locked. Our actors dramatize what police believe happened next on that evening. There was a knock. So when these men knock at the door, our victim, Deontay Dean, does what any grown man would do. He goes to the door and says, who's there? But there's no answer. So he says it again, who's there? Still no answer. So he peeks out the window that's next to the door, and that's when it happened. Gunfire rang out. Bullets pierced the cold, damp air. For this family, life was unalterably changed on January 1st, and the city of Chattanooga had just registered its first murder. There's one part of this murder we're not going to try to recreate. It's just too horrible to imagine. To dramatize it would be beneath our mission here with Crime Stoppers. But realize, this man's life was taken in his own home with his girlfriend and children at home. As a matter of fact, he was killed right in front of his two-year-old child. I like doing sciencey stuff because, you know, I like how rocks is and I like to find rocks, minerals, and if I ever find diamonds, I want to be rich. <laughs> Sean is a delight in class because of his imagination and curiosity. It's like one of the pots that the Indians made. Wow. And science isn't the only class he enjoys. And uh, the reason why I like social studies is because it's just a lot of historical stuff that's been touched by historical people and been used by people back in the history old days. And I found a place with a lot of stuff. Sean has a positive attitude and loves his friends and meeting new people. He will thrive in the security and consistency of a forever family. And he'd especially like to be able to spend time outside. I like the outdoors because I like to go hiking. And I, think one of the, I think the wilderness is my friend because it has something to do with the sun. Baby boomers grew up dreaming of living in a Jetson-style world. At Marion County High School, they're no longer dreaming. They're writing code, building robots, and putting them to work. And then set your speed to 67. Teacher Aaron Basham is proud to be among the first in a new wave of high schools incorporating robotics into engineering classes. It's taking the home ec and shop class of the past into the 21st century. It's like engineering, but it's not like doing a bunch of math problems. It's like fun. I feel like I could use it because it's like everything's going to end up being coding like the farther we go with technology. Yes, much of the time is spent watching these devices roam around the floor, but this is just a warm up for competitions to design a robot that can find objects, retrieve them and put them in their place. This is what leads to devices that can assist in surgery or underground rescue situations, not to mention a little help for an aging population. My pops in a wheelchair. Honestly, I'd, I'd like to invent something for a wheelchair to like program it to where you could say, I need newspaper, plug it in, download it, and just run and get the newspaper. The next step is installing sensors and programming to make them capable of operating without human direction. 
Yes, Mr. Basham says this is good workforce training, giving students a head start when they apply at new manufacturing plants already in the Tennessee Valley and those on the way. Anything's possible with the amount of technology we have right now.